to the Cake Sugar Coach podcast. Join me each week as I interview experts who will share the science of sugar, sugar addiction, and different approaches to recovery. We hope to empower you with the information and inspiration, insights, and strategies you need to break up with sugar and fall in love with healthy whole foods so you can prevent and reverse chronic disease, lose weight, boost your mood, and energy. Feel free to go to my website for details on my coaching programs and to access free resources, kicksugarcoach.com. Welcome everybody to an interview today with Dr. Rob Lufkin. He is a practicing physician and he's also the author of over 200 peer-reviewed scientific uh, papers, 14 books that are available in six languages. He's a full professor at the UCLA and USC schools of medicine. And he has given lectures and keynote speeches around the world. And he was named one of the 100 most creative people in Los Angeles by Buzz Magazine. And his latest book is a very shocking title. As a professor in the Faculty of Medicine, he has written a book called, are you ready for this? Lies I Taught in Medical School. This book is amazing, and we're gonna we're gonna deep dive into some of those uh, insights that Dr. Lovkin has uh, shares in that book. He is currently a clinical professor of radiology at the USC School of Medicine, and he has an applied academic focus on the science of longevity. He's also the chief of metabolic imaging at a large medical network in Southern California. And last not but least, Dr. Lovkin has his own journey of recovery from metabolic syndrome and probably had, had his own journey with sugar. I don't actually know it, but we're going to find out together. So welcome, welcome, Dr. Lufkin. Hey, Florence. Uh, thank you so much. I'm a big fan of your work. I'm, I'm honored to be on this summit. I'm really looking forward to our conversation today. <laughs> well, let's start with your journey, because I think that's when all the light bulbs started to go on, that here you are, you're, you're sick, and you're realizing that all the things you taught in med school weren't exactly helping you. So do you want to tell us a little bit more about your journey to wellness? Sure, yeah. I mean, I started out from a very young age being immersed in nutrition guidance. As it turns out, my mom was a was a practicing dietitian. She worked her whole life uh, full time as a dietitian at various hospitals. And as your audience knows, I'm sure a dietitian, dietitians are the people who are in charge of determining the diet for for patients, and they're sort of the nutritional experts. So. Uh, growing up, I was, uh, you know, I was taught to, uh, you know, avoid saturated fats, you know, I, I avoided um, uh, any food containing fats, high fat food, instead, I, I went uh, to low fat foods, and uh, I substituted uh, margarine for butter, which had trans fats and, and uh, <laughs> seed oils in them. And, uh uh, I, I followed all all this advice, and um, so far so good. I, I became interested in nutrition and medicine. I went to medical school. I stayed on. I became a professor, and and everything was fine. Uh, I had a couple of kids. My life was going great, and then I came down with four diseases that, um, at first glance, I thought were very different. One was something in my joints called gout, and another one was hypertension. Another one was. Uh, uh, abnormal blood lipids, and one was pre-diabetes. And, and um, I went to my doctor, and I was prescribed medicines for each one of those, and I started taking the medicines. But I realized that those were diseases that um, my father had died of, but my father was in his uh, 80s, almost 90 years old when he died, and I was much younger. And I realized that getting them early like this it, this wasn't going to end well. I had kids who weren't even in high school yet or middle school. So I began to, uh, out of self-interest, look at the literature and began researching this this whole area. And um, it was just, it was shocking that there's there's been so much work done now, This that there's so much more we understand in this field of, of nutrition and lifestyle. And uh, there were many things that I'd overlooked and I was frankly was teaching incorrectly and are still being taught incorrectly at, at uh, many medical schools in my in my opinion. So uh, I basically long story short, I, I took these recommendations about my nutrition and lifestyle. I implemented them myself. I went back to see my doctors and 
they they couldn't believe it. They said, what happened to you? What are you doing? You know, what's going on? And they basically, all the diseases were reversed and um, I was off all prescription medicines. And so it, it was just a wake up call for me. And I, you know, I'm trying to share this information with other people. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Did you, were you a sweet tooth guy? Like, do you feel like you might've been, did sugar have a little hook in you? Oh yeah. I'm a, I am a recovering process <laughs> food addict. And um, yeah, I'm, I, you know, I, despite my mom, you know, telling me what not to eat, I, it was still okay to eat sugar and can't, you know, certain types of candy because they didn't contain fat, you know, fat was the evil, but sugar was okay. So we substituted sugar in the low fat yogurt for the fat and that became the healthy substitute. So uh, yeah. And to this day, I still, you know, I love junk food. I, I can't keep it in the house um, because, you know, I'll I'll break down and, and eat it. So I'm I'm constantly uh, fighting that battle that you're very experienced in with your work. Oh, that's such a relief to hear that. I mean, it shouldn't I misery should not love company, but I'm like, that's so interesting that a doctor gets it. Yeah, that you <laughs> literally can't have it in your house. So now that this is kind of really exciting that you're a professor in med school because you're actually teaching the upcoming generations of doctors how to approach, you know, these these metabolic related diseases. Are you having an impact on the curriculum of medical schools? Yeah, I mean, the curriculum is gradually changing, but it's not, in my opinion, it's not changing fast enough. And and um the way medical schools taught their silos in different areas. And my specialty in medical school is not nutrition. So I'm actually not the one teaching the kids nutrition. And um, to this day, leading medical schools still teach that a calorie is just a calorie. If you want to lose weight, you exercise more and you eat less, you know, which, which I disagree with uh, for a number of reasons. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's been a great journey. I mean, one thing I learned to, to, to speaking to your work was that, and I, I'm still learning this now, that um, I learned that that a lot of things were bad, in particular sugar and glucose. Um, and I realized it was bad. And um, I think a lot of people are more and more realizing it's bad. But what I came to understand in my experience was that I think at first I thought, we'll just have to tell people, you know, once they see the evidence, you explain it to them, hey, sugar's bad, people will stop eating sugar. But I realized that didn't happen at all. Very intelligent people would would know that sugar's bad, but they would go back to eating it. And it's, I understand much more now that it's, it's a compulsion, it's an addiction. It's not enough just to educate people, but they have to be most people have to be engaged in an active process of treating the addiction and dealing with it a number of ways that I know your, you know, your program addresses in some really innovative ways. Mm, Yes, exactly. And it's such a relief for people to go, yeah, this is just, this is the nature of these foods. They, they hook us, they hijack our brains, right? And that when you understand that you're going to stop trying harder, you're going to just do things differently. Um, try and outsmart it. And, and then eventually your body at first will resist because it's fallen in love with it and it thinks it can't live without it. And then over time is the longer you are walking the path of whole foods, the more your body becomes an ally. It's like, oh no, you were right. This is better. I, I <laughs> These foods taste better. I actually prefer my life better, right? And the body becomes an ally. It's just such a journey. You need so much support to get to that epiphany. So what exactly is the problem with sugar? Why is sugar such such a detriment? Why does it drive chronic disease and contribute to aging and mental health issues, the whole shebang? Yeah, that was that was a real revelation for me that, um, you know, as a as a physician, as a professor, I knew that sugar was associated with certain diseases like diabetes, obviously. Um, But what was real wake up call for me was that sugar and the mayhem that uh, sugar causes in our body affects us at a very fundamental level that drives not just obesity, not just diabetes, 
but it also drives the the joint pain I had, the the gout. Uh, it also drives the number one killer that we're all gonna that's going to determine most of our longevity, which is cardiovascular disease. It drives that. It also drives uh, cancer. For many, many cancers, sugar is a is a factor there. And then finally, the one disease that that at least mainstream medicine has no treatment for Alzheimer's disease, sugar also drives that in, in many forms of Alzheimer's disease, not all, but but some forms you can have very dramatic results just with nutritional nu cha nutritional changes. And its association with diabetes is now, it's, it's sometimes referred to as type three diabetes because of the strong association there. So, so the, the, the wake up call was that, um, that sugar and and other types of refined carbohydrates which are converted to sugar in our bodies um are, are a root cause for various different types of diseases that in the past i thought were completely separated and you know had different treatments for but as it turns out by improving my nutrition and and addressing the, the sugar issues, it's possible to improve the risk factors for all these diseases across the board. And it turns out on the longevity side, there have been a number of breakthroughs uh, in this last decade about longevity. There are, literally, there are literally some drugs in our understanding now that can make animals live significantly longer. And these are even being applied to humans now. And one of the basic mechanisms for, for longevity is a, is a protein called mTOR, which is, uh, as it, as it, it's, it's turned on by glucose and you can affect mTOR and and make it make it worse on our bodies by consuming glucose and the drug rapamycin you may have heard about which is this miracle longevity drug actually works by turning down mTOR and turning down the effects of glucose on that so glucose has first of all it has a tremendous effect across all these various diseases so What's the problem? What's the problem with glucose? Um, glucose is uh, it's fundamental to our bodies, right? Uh, a lot of our many of our cell or some of our cells require glucose to run. Um, most of our cells will run on glucose, but they can also run on alternative fuel called ketones. Um, so you can either run on ketones or glucose uh, today. Most of us run on glucose all the time, and that's the mTOR switch is switched to the glucose side, which is the aging side. By switching to ketones, there are a number of advantages, and we can do this through our diet. When we decrease the amount of glucose we consume, or if we do intermittent fasting, we can switch our, our, our diets to where we consume more ketones, and this is a much more healthy state. So what's wrong with, what's wrong with glucose? Glucose, although it's it's necessary for, for some of our cells to survive. High levels of glucose in our body or even moderate levels in our bloodstream have damaging effects. Uh, glucose has a reaction called a glycation reaction where unlike almost any other chemical, it bonds with it binds with uh, proteins and, and other molecules and sort of gunks them up. In fact, you've probably talked about the hemoglobin A1C blood test that, that measures glycation damage to red blood cells. Uh, and it's a it's used as a diagnostic criteria for diabetes. And so the higher the blood our blood levels of glucose spike, the more of this glycation damage is done by the glucose. Glucose has a number of other effects um, driving mTOR, driving the driving the glycation uh, uh, damage. And overall, most, most people in this space agree that it, it's it's better to keep the spikes of glucose down. And when we eat food containing glucose, we get spikes in our bloodstream. It's better if we keep those spikes lower. Certainly, everyone agrees for diabetics, it's better that we keep those lower because diabetics are vulnerable to those glucose spikes. One revelation I had that my thinking has changed about diabetes is that I used to believe, and most of my colleagues still believe this, that type 2 diabetes, which is the 
the 90% of diabetics now are type two diabetes. It's the number one cause. It's, it's caused by the sugar intake and insulin resistance where our body has to produce more and more insulin and the HA1C levels keep going up and up and up. This type two diabetes, I used to think that it was either, you know, something you got or you didn't get, you know, you're either a diabetic or you're not. And that's the way the healthcare system is set up. Basically, your HA1C levels keep going like this, but you're not diagnosed a diabetic until it crosses a certain threshold, right? Mm -hmm. And then and then your doctor can prescribe insulin and metformin, and they can charge for the visit. But if your HA1C is lower than that, you're not a diabetic. But it could still be abnormal as it goes from its very low levels, which we have in childhood, to higher and higher levels. My thinking has changed on this in that I no longer believe that type 2 diabetes is something that some people get and other people don't get, um, just kind of randomly or based on their genetics or their nutrition. There was an interesting study that came out recently uh, from a large population of non-diabetic adults in, in America from the Framingham study and then the NHANES data. They looked at H1, H, HA1C levels, this marker for glucose damage. And they looked at the average levels in these non-diabetics versus age. And what they found was the HA1C levels kept getting higher and higher over time uh, with aging, with normal aging. And eventually they'll cross and these people will be in a diabetic range. So what I now believe is that type 2 diabetes is not something that you either get or you don't get randomly. I think we're all on the path to it. It's sort of like gray hair. In other words, if I don't die of something else before then, I will eventually get type 2 diabetes. Just like, you know, we're all going to die of something. And it's, you know, it maybe one of the diseases I mentioned. But the point is, I think we all have to be on the alert for glucose damage and the effects of glucose in our diet, even though we're not diagnosed as type two diabetics, in my opinion, we're all on the route to it. And it's, it's a factor in aging for all of us. Even if we don't cross the line for diabetes, elevated glucose can cause these aging changes, these advanced glycation end products, AGEs that you probably talked about. Um, so the point is that I think, in my opinion, everyone should watch out for the glucose in their diet. Everyone should choose a diet that that regulates the amount of sugar and refined carbohydrates just because they're on that path to diabetes if they live long enough, you know. And that's a, that's kind of a different way of looking at it than, oh, you're not diabetic. Okay, you don't have to worry. Eat whatever you want. Um, I, I don't think that's, I don't, I don't follow that anymore. Got it. So it's like, basically, we're all on the spectrum. It's just a question of how quickly you're headed to falling off the cliff, right? Can you slow that down? Or maybe even never, ever reach the edge of the cliff. You can die as someone who's not been diagnosed with these dangerously high levels of sugar and a malfunctioning metabolic system. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I recently just finished watching a five-part series. I think it was a five-part series on Blue Zones. It was on Netflix. And I can imagine, have you seen them? Have you seen it yet? Uh, I haven't seen the series. I'm familiar with Dan Butner's work. And yes. I'm, I'm going to be at a conference with him on Saturday. Oh, uh, my gosh. At Radfest. Uh, yeah, oh. or coming up, a conference coming up. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, he, I, I mean, I read his book years ago and loved it, loved his work. What such earnest, such earnest and in good intention to help the world live longer and not just longer, but happier, truly healthy and happy. And in his five-part series, he just kept stressing, stressing carbs it's like look at the in in japan it's the purple potatoes that they eat the sweet potatoes and in uh costa rica it's the ground at uh, corn and and he keeps stressing how you know how important these starches are in these whole grain whole food plant based now they're all whole foods which is great but many people are going to hear what you're saying and go but i just watched that documentary series now i'm so confused can you speak to that well, I, I I love a lot of the Blue Zone philosophy and the messaging, and especially things about community and working together and family and friends. 
things about um, some of the dietary things are, are, are really valuable. The the science, I don't necessarily agree with. There's been a lot of controversy about the blue zones recently there because they're typically poor socioeconomic areas uh, and you don't expect health care, good health and longevity with poverty. Um, sometimes it can happen, but in general, that's not the case. And what the critics have, have uh, the critics of the science behind the blue zones is they've talked about that part of the problem with poor socioeconomics that contributes to long, long, long lived people is poor record keeping on the birth dates. And they've gone back to some of the blue zones. And as the blue zones have moved into, you know, they become better economically and they have better healthcare programs, better record keeping the, the artifact of um, uh, the, the number of centenarians and super centenarians, people living over 100 and 110 actually decrease. And then uh, someone looked at the statistics of um, the centenarians and the super centenarians. And when they looked at the st statistical changes in the birth dates of the people who were at the greatest ages in these populations, they found that the birth dates tended to fall on the first of the month or <laughs> they tended to fall on certain days, which was different than the rest of the population, which suggested that they might be, you know, selected in some fashion or, you know, just as a result of poor record keeping and all. But be that as it may, putting the science aside, the the values of the blue zone i think of that we can affect our longevity with family with lifestyle with diet and and these factors i think is true and i i agree with it and it's totally true so it's it's exciting that they're doing that and you know they're getting we're getting more and more data all the time and and we're learning all the time. So, uh, you know, I, I wish them the best results. And I'm looking forward to seeing the new stuff. And I want to I want to watch that that special as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I but as I was watching and my husband, because he knows me so well, he's like, you, t you tell them, Florence. I'm like, Dan, <laughs> it's not what they're eating. It's what they're not eating. There's no sugar. There's no processed foods. There's nothing. There's no junk in any of it. So it don't don't make those whole foods look like they're the secret. The secret is that what they're not eating. And he didn't. I don't think he put enough focus on that piece. So people are going to go out and buy purple sweet potatoes thinking this is the secret food. No, no, it's the, it's the secret is, is be active, be connected, eat whole foods. And if you haven't damaged your metabolism, you could probably handle a high starch diet because you're not damaged. Your body can deal with it, but most of us are damaged and we have to have a different, we have to be more mindful of the kind of nutritional intervention that we're using to try and reverse metabolic syndrome. So that's my two cents on that. <laughs> I agree. I agree. <laughs> Beautifully said. <laughs> so um, talk to us a little bit about metabolic syndrome. So it sounds like there's this, you know, these processed foods and a, the stress and our, all those things kind of come together and create a whole cascade of different health issues. Tell me exactly how the metabolism is tied in with that and what are the symptoms? Yeah, well, uh, you, you, your audience, you've probably spoken about syndrome X or metabolic syndrome, Gerald Raven at Stanford. I haven't, uh, I haven't had anyone mention it too much yet. So feel free okay. to. Okay. Well, it was a, it was a, this was, this was mentioned many years ago by a researcher at Stanford and, and other people began publicizing it, but it, it emphasized an interesting association of symptoms that people had, which was literally waist size or girth and uh, high blood pressure. And then also abnormalities in certain, in certain lipids as well. And, and glucose abnormalities. And they, they coined a term for this called syndrome X or metabolic syndrome. And it was, it was one of the earlier times where people were putting together this idea that something like high blood pressure is related to sugar, <laughs> you know, and, um, and that uh, abnormal lipids is related to um, uh, abdominal girth and things like that. So they began putting 
putting this together and uh, characterizing it. And it was very controversial in the beginning because everyone at that time uh, was eating a low fat diet, which was high in carbs and low in fat uh, based on the food pyramid at the time, the USDA food pyramid. And still today, people, many people continue to eat this kind of diet. But the idea with metabolic syndrome is that there is an underlying metabolic factor that was driving basically all these diseases, these very diseases that was separate from the prevailing hypothesis of the time, which was that um, you get a heart attack because you eat egg yolks and the cholesterol clogs your blood vessels or saturated fat. Now to this day, today, uh, even the American Heart Association agrees it's okay to eat eggs and they're probably one of the healthiest things you can eat as many as you want. Dietary cholesterol doesn't affect serum cholesterol and serum cholesterol may or may not be a highly significant factor in, in heart disease. So it, it was going against the idea that, that fat was ca driving cardiovascular disease and it, it sort of opened the, the window that other factors that were driving metabolic syndrome and things like uh, glucose metabolism and sugar sugar intake and carbohydrate intake. That that was the the, the interesting thing about that that factor and and our thinking about it is still evolving today. Mm -hmm. And I think there's so many people too that think, oh well, I'm not overweight. I don't. All my blood work seems fine. I'm probably good but you probably fell into that category until all of a sudden you wound up with four diseases. Although were you, you were a little bit overweight, right? I was, um, you know, I had a dad bod, you know, <laughs> uh, but not, not noticeably overweight. And it's interesting. There's a, there's a famous study from a couple of years, a few years ago on metabolic syndrome, where they took the five symptoms of metabolic syndrome, the things, things that I was mentioning, and they looked at a large population of adult Americans and they they tracked how many people had at least one of those diagnosed by their healthcare provider. And it was a staggering 88% of Americans had at least one factor in metabolic syndrome and thus were metabolically unhealthy. So that was really an uh, eye-opening study that's still quoted a lot today. I know. And you think, who who are the 22? Like, who are the 22? Is that right? Did I do? No, 18. Yeah. <laughs> or whatever it is. I'm, I'm forget the math. <laughs> but you know, those those rare, rare percentages that of people who are not metabolically unhealthy. And I wonder if there are people that were and thought, I, I can't do this. It's going to kill me. Right. They had the awakening and they got back on a better path. Or if they just got lucky to grow up in families where people were right off the hop, not, sh you know, not consuming the sad diet. Yeah. And, and, you know, there are outliers, you know, people on the, on a carnivore diet. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting. This is a, it's sort of like the vegan diet with only vegetables, only it's only meat. And see interesting studies on the carnivore diet, almost to a person, they can reverse type two diabetes just by going on a carnivore diet for, for many, many people. And if you're a diabetic, you should always do this with the care of a physician. Uh, but it's remarkable to think that type two diabetes can be reversed um, just by eliminating basically sugar and carbohydrates from your diet, which is what a, a carnivore diet does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I will just put in a shameless plug that I've seen people reverse diabetes and not go on a carnivore diet. But, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I've seen people be on a very moderate diet. I, I Through my 12 step years, I saw people come in obese, depressed, multiple, 10, 20, 10, 15 different kinds of medications, 30 years of being diabetic. And I've seen them go from off all their medications. Just, yeah, just balanced meals, three meals, no snacks. They had protein, veggies, healthy carbs, some fruit, like all the food groups were included. And I've seen them over and over and over reverse diabetes. So it really just depends on your body, which is where your doctor and your CGM can be your, your buddy. <laughs> Talk, talk to us about sugar substitutes. Not a lot of people do. Um, I still feel like there's a lot of keto uh, doctors and advocates who still say, oh, don't worry about those. What's your opinion on them? Yeah. Um, I mean, 
after I figured out sugar was bad, then I became a diet Coke junkie. Wow. And I would eat, I would drink a lot of diet Coke, telling myself I was healthy, you know, how bad can it be? All the supermodels drink it, you know, and they're skinny. It, it wasn't for weight, though. It was it was for metabolic health. And I think um, Jason Fung, I don't know if you're he's on the program here, but he's he's uh, someone who I respect greatly. He deals a lot with fasting and nutrition, and he's a nephrologist who specializes in kidney disease. And no surprise, the number one cause of renal failure and dialysis in this country is type two diabetes. Uh, as well as amputations and blindness and other things. But so he's, a, he's an expert in that area. And um, he, he speaks very eloquently about sugar substitutes. Be, and there, well, first of all, there, there are a number of effects depending on the sugar substitute. Some of them affect your gut microbiome, which, which basically messes up the, the bacteria and the organisms in your digestive system so that, so that things are absorbed differently or you may get leaky gut. So that that can be a negative effect kind of independent of, of glucose regulation. Um, you know, there's some, some of them, you know, they're talking about cancer risk and, and you know, the evidence is, is not that strong, but anytime people talk about cancer risk, you know, it gets my attention um, no matter what. So if it's something that I don't really need and there's at least even a shred of cancer risk evidence, I, I pay attention to it. Um, but I think the the overall problem with sugar substitutes is is much more global. And that that has to do with the fact that um our body um our bodies recognize sweetness, what we what we perceive to be sweetness and whether it's from sugar or a sugar substitute, that's how sugar substitutes work. They fool us into thinking it's sweet. And once we anticipate that sweetness or actually taste it, it triggers certain reactions in our bodies um, to deal with the sugar, things like insulin going up and, you know, bad things. Insulin going up is a bad thing in our body because it drives insulin resistance and it drives aging, it drives mTOR, it, it, it's not a good thing. It's one of the bad effects of glucose. So if I drink a diet soda, sweetened with whatever it is, the sweetness will drive metabolism in my body with things like insulin and other things, as if I was taking sugar, even though there's no, there's no glucose or fructose in it per se. So I still get the negative effects on my metabolism of the of the sugar. So there's so with that in mind, there's almost nothing you can eat that if it tastes sweet, it's going to have this they call it a cephalic effect or brain, you know, brain effect on sweetness. The other thing that I like when I cut out sugar, and you're you're an expert in this, of course, I'm sure you've seen this, is that when I eat less sugar, I become more sensitive to it. So that before when I was eating junk food, I'd eat an apple and it would taste like, you know, it tastes like cardboard. There's no flavor to it because I'm constantly bombarding my system with all these flavors and sugar and everything. When I'm, when I'm off sugar and I, you know, I'm in a healthy metabolic state, if I eat an apple, it's like, wow, you know, it's sweet, it's rich, it's flavorful and sort of reset my body. And I may get a small insulin spike, but it, it goes down very quickly on my CGM. So, mm -hmm. so those are, that's my two cents on uh, sugar substitutes. I wish there was one that, that worked without a cephalic response, but I want to be able to enjoy natural sugar when I get it in small amounts in my daily life. And by having sugar substitutes, I find in my case, it suppresses that. Mm, totally. Oh my gosh. Thank you for mentioning that. And I, I, I think the other thing too, is that they are still chemicals and they're toxic to the body. If they're not nutritious, we, I mean, how can they be good? Um, and I, I, I have had people come on my summit and say, oh, well, as long as you're not, as long as you're not gaining weight and your, you know, your weights managed, don't worry about them. And I think, wow, that's just such a narrow, that's just like looking through a little lens, like broaden it up a little bit, right? Microbiome. What's it doing to our taste buds? 
what's it doing in our bloodstream? Like, it, yeah. Anyways, thank you for your courage and coming yeah, on. And all, all people who are metabolically healthy aren't obese. You know, there are, there are skinny people who are very metabolically unhealthy who will die of heart attacks and get Alzheimer's and cancer mm -hmm. and, and these other diseases. And they, they, they may not get diabetes. They may get something else. But the point is, you shouldn't say I'm not fat, so I don't have to worry about any of this stuff. Um, I think I think we all have to worry about it if we want to live a long and healthy life. Right, right. And let's talk about the impact of, of sugar on aging. So I understand it impacts wrinkles, our skin, our eyes. What else does it impact? Like how else does sugar age us quicker? Well, there's an interesting thing. Remember, I told you about this protein called mTOR that is basically it's it's a fundamental biological protein. It was only discovered 20 years ago, but it's present all the way from yeast to human beings. And it's uh, one arguably the single most important survival protein. But basically, it detects nutrients in our body and then tells the body to grow or not grow. And when it detects glucose it tells the body to grow. And this has deleterious effects related to aging. And the example of that is there's a drug called rapamycin, which is, it turns mTOR down. It suppresses the effects of glucose on mTOR. And when you give rapamycin to, uh, you put rapamycin cream on humans uh, in a matter of six months following skin biopsies in these brave people, they actually had reversal of uh, some of the skin damage and the collagen improved. It was really a dramatic response. You give uh, rapamycin to uh, mice, uh, their hair grows back, they their gray hair goes away. In, in the mice model, it's now being looked at in humans with rapamycin shampoo. Um, the um, it's also affecting things like hearing loss, age-related hearing loss in the animal model. You give rapamycin, you turn mTOR back, you stop the glucose effects of the mTOR, and the hearing actually improves in these. But it's it's all these phenotypes of aging, not just you know um, other things. Periodontal disease, as we get older, you get it. Rapamycin reverses periodontal disease in the animal models, and they're now studying humans with it. Even menopause. Menopause is a disease of aging, right? Um, only half the people get it, but it's still a disease of aging. When you give rapamycin to animals, uh, it actually slows down menopause. It delays menopause, increases fertility, and now it's being used in humans in trials to show this. So it has all turning down mTOR and the effects of glucose has all these dramatic effects on the appearances of aging, but let's get real. I mean, nobody dies of men menopause. Nobody dies of baldness or, or nobody dies of wrinkles, right? So what determines our longevity? It's basically those five diseases we talked about earlier. 80% of us will die of, you know, diabetes related complications, cardiovascular disease and stroke, heart attacks, cancer, and Alzheimer's disease. Those are the big ones. So if turning down mTOR and reducing the effects of glucose on this with this drug called rapamycin, if it really improves longevity, if it really has a significant effect, it should also work on every single one of those diseases, not just gray hair and wrinkles and everything. So when we give rapamycin to people with heart attacks and atherosclerosis, which is narrowing the blood vessels, it rapamycin is actually FDA approved to coat the stents that are put in the blood vessels when you get a heart attack because the stents, the stents don't really treat the heart attack. They just keep you from dying. They don't change your longevity or your lifespan because the underlying disease that's driven by metabolism and sugar is, is narrowing in the blood vessels and that narrowing continues. But when you put rapamycin on these stents, which are little things that open up the blood vessels, um, it actually slows the, slows the atherosclerosis. So it works for those. Cancer, Rapamycin is FDA approved to treat several cancers because of its slowing effect on the cancers, renal cell cancer, metastatic renal cell cancer, the number one kidney cancer, rapamycin is FDA approved for that, and a number of other cancers. Um, Alzheimer's disease. When rapamycin is given to a mouse model of Alzheimer's disease, it actually improves cognition so significantly that now 
the University of Texas, I think other studies, other locations are now looking at rapamycin to um, treat Alzheimer's patients as a model for Alzheimer's. And we know that, you know, putting people on a low glucose or ketogenic diet for some patients can literally reverse Alzheimer's disease. So we know it has all those effects there. So turning down mTOR and negating the effects of this glucose that's hitting us all the time can have dramatic effects on all these diseases of aging. And literally in the animal models for longevity, it can increase the lifespan in mice. Well, actually everything from yeast, fruit flies, worms and mice, 20 to 30%. And it's now being used in humans as a as an off-label use from people that are investigating it. So, so gosh, it sounds like a wonder drug. Is there any side effects? Like I always feel like there's fine print. So it sounds like everyone, if, if I was listening to this, I'd be like, oh, I'll go get stocks in that company. Um, <laughs> Cause it sounds like a wonder drug. Is it like, or is there side effects? Like what, what would be the benefit of going on rapamycin and allowing ourselves to just eat like a, like normal mainstream diet versus doing what you're suggesting, which is do the hard work of breaking up a sugar, keeping it out of the house and eating mostly low carbohydrate diet? Well, one thing rapamycin is prescription only. So you need to get your physician to prescribe it. And mm -hmm. using rapamycin for longevity is an off label use. So your your physician may not want to prescribe it. He goes, Hey, this is a cancer drug. This is a, you know, this is a atherosclerosis drug. Why would I give it to you? You're healthy, blah, blah, blah. So if they don't understand rapamycin, so the dose has to be tightly controlled. The side effects though are, are very small, but the problem is we really don't understand longevity. We don't understand these diseases. You know, I've been doing this for 50 years and this is what I do all day, every day. And we still don't understand it, these diseases. And rapamycin is very new. And there, there are things we don't even understand about rapamycin. If you combine rapamycin with another diabetes drug called acarbos, that's FDA approved for diabetes, you get an even greater longevity enhancement in, in the animal model for longevity, which goes beyond what rapamycin does. So we don't even know that rapamycin is the end all. There's probably other things. There are other things we don't understand. Now, as we as you mentioned, you can simulate the effects of rapamycin by turning down mTOR by, by your diet, reducing glucose, reducing carbs, intermittent fasting, exercise, all these things also turn down mTOR with lifestyle. So the question is, why not, you know, why not just take the pill? Why not do the lifestyle? Well, because probably one, we really don't understand the pill. And two, you're probably going to get much bigger effects. Well, or, or bigger effects with a combination than you will with either one. And right now, if you're, you know, if you're of a certain age, you have to think that aging is 100% fatal, and you're on track to die of aging. You know, it, it's just what it is. So if you want to do everything you can, you should do lifestyle too. <laughs> and go ahead, take rapamycin, you know, that's fine too. But I would not cut out the lifestyle effects, the, the dietary, the nutritional things like you work with the junk foods, cutting that out, and, and the other factors. So I would cover your bets and do, do everything. But I don't think, no, rapamycin by itself is not the solution. If you don't do it without with a lifestyle, I think you're going to possibly lose a lot of its benefits. Mm -hmm. Got it, got it. Amazing. Is there any final words you'd like to share today on the topic of sugar, uh, health, lies that you, you taught in medical school? Anything from your book you wanted to highlight? Yeah, just that I... I'm a huge fan of the work you're doing with sugar and helping people. And I, I send people your way because it's, it's, you know, just like myself, my colleagues, my friends, it's not enough just to know that sugar is harmful, but for many of us, it's important to be engaged in, in a program where we can get support, maybe coaching other things where we're in a community and we can, you know, we can fight this battle together and make our lives healthier that way. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks for your work. And if you guys haven't got a copy of his book yet, it goes through very, each chapter has like a different topic, heart disease and uh, high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, obesity, and just really eye opening science and insights into those. So be sure to grab your copy. And thank you again, Dr. Lufkin.
Thanks, Lawrence. Appreciate all the great work you do. Ditto. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in this week. If you would like more interviews, more information, and more inspiration on how to break up with sugar, go to my YouTube channel, Kick Sugar Coach, or my website, kicksugarcoach.com. See you next week.